In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I want you to know that the reason why Jill and I run so hard is for you. Because we love you guys. I mean, I, wanna, I, I know you love us, and we, we just want you to know how much we love you. And there are so many people, and then when it says a cloud of witnesses, there's also people that have sacrificed. And I'm very aware of the sacrifices that people have made for this ministry. I'm very aware, and there's, there's people that have sacrificed for this ministry that aren't with us any longer. I'm very aware of Michael Johnson's sacrifices when we first started. You know, who's an electrician that gave countless hours to the ministry. I'm very aware of James Whalen's sacrifices. I'm very aware of Peter Quinn's sacrifices, who is one of uh, the, the members. He's one of the reasons why we are in this location. I'm very aware of Joe Coons' sacrifices. I'm very aware of the saints who sacrificed so that we could get to where we are. And this is, this is important for us because you've sacrificed and people who are no longer with us have sacrificed. So when, when, I, when I think about that, it just brings such a, a, a responsibility to me that we got to hold the ground. We got to hold the ground that God has given us. We got to occupy the territory because they didn't sacrifice. And all the people who, are, who sowed into our lives because none of us are really where we are because somebody didn't help. Everybody is where they are because somebody helped. Jesus helped. Mom and dad helped. You know, so one of the best things that we could do is just really remember those things. And that's one of the, my prayers each, each week, each day. Is that we stay conscious of all of the sacrifices that everybody has made along the way. Now let's go to uh, the, the scripture. And this is what the Lord has really been saying. Because we, we are in a state of spiritual warfare. Where there are a lot of people going through a lot of difficult things and there's a lot of challenges that are going on right now. And, and we need to know and we need to understand that there's a difference. In this, when I talk about spiritual warfare, some people are like, we're, well, we got to fight to gain a victory. That's not what we're doing. We have the victory. It's been given to us by Jesus. We're called to be not forces that are going to battle, but we're called to be occupational forces. You know what an occupational force is? An occupational force is the, the troops that are sent in once the victory has already been won. And they enforce the victory. They enforce the victory by making sure that there is lasting peace in that territory. You and I are called to enforce the victory that Jesus paid for with his very life. To occupy the territory that he has given to us. We must battle. For us to do this, we got to battle on two fronts. And I'm not fully sure that the church as a whole understands the two fronts. It's almost like when you, when you go into war, you got to battle on in air and then also on land. So there's two fronts. The two fronts are the spiritual and then also in the soul. For us to enforce the victory that Jesus has given to us, we need to recognize as spiritual people that there is a spiritual realm. There is. If we believe in the good guy, God, we got to believe in the bad guy. Satan and his minions. His job is to steal, kill, and to destroy. It says that in John chapter 10, verse 10. Demons are real. Devils are real. There's a spiritual realm all around us. Now, I'm going to go over a few things. And sometimes when you go over some of the spiritual things, sometimes people are like, well, everything's the demon. No, 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 no. That's not the case. Remember, there's two fronts that we have. If we're going to enforce the victory, if we're going to maintain the deliverance that we have, if we're going to maintain what God has given to us as born-again, blood-bought children of the Most High God, we've got to fight the enemy on two fronts. Because demons are real. Devils are real. They want to live out their personality in you. A spirit of anger wants to live out its personality in you. Uh, a spirit of lust wants to live out its personality in you. A spirit of pride wants to live out its personality in you. Those spirits are on the outside. There's a spiritual realm. 
It's all throughout the scripture. Jesus spoke about them. Now, those demons, those devils, they want to live their personality out inside you. And this is the way it, this is the way it looks. It's almost like this. I'm, it's almost like we become an avatar to them. Does anyone know what an avatar is? Yeah. All right. Does anyone remember that 2009 movie with those purple people? Some of you guys are dating yourself. Does everybody know what an avatar is? Yeah. It's basically an embodiment. So those, those spirits, they want to live out their personality inside of me. They're parasites. They want to come and whatever their personality is, they want to live it out inside of me. You know, when you, when you get a phone call or something like that, and they're in, on the phones and on Facebook, they have those little avatars. You know, those little embodiments of our personality. It's interesting. Is every, everybody knows what I'm, what I'm talking about when I talk about the, the avatars, right? All right, don't show that you're a boomer. Does anybody know what a boomer is? Because I got told what a boomer is. I wasn't really sure about how to do it. So one of the young kids called me a boomer. And I, I, I just kind of reacted back to him. I said, well, you're a zoomer. And he's like, what's a zoomer? Somebody who's going fast and doesn't know where he's going. But anyway, I was like, if he's going to give me a hard time, he better expect it too. Because I'm going to give it to him a little bit. But basically, an avatar is something that uh, is an embodiment where something else comes and lives out its personality inside of it. These demon spirits, they, they want a little bit of a place. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, give no place to the enemy. This is what I've learned about the enemy. If you give him a little bit of a place, he's gonna, you give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. Mark chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. What you hear in church a lot of times today are really motivational messages. I mean, there's a lot of self-help motivational messages. And this is what I, a lot of this stuff is like, when I, when I was hearing some of that stuff, I was getting tore out the frame, getting beat up from the feet up. I was like wondering what's going on. I'm like, what's, what am I doing wrong? And I was fighting the enemy on just one front. And I needed to learn to fight the enemy on both fronts. When Jesus spoke to the devils, he cast them out. Where did they go? It says in Mark chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, it says, A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus. Remember, we're not, demons are not on equal plane with Jesus. They're not on equal plane even with us. Angels aren't even on an equal plane with you. You know that we're called to judge angels? That, that's what it speaks about in the scriptures. Sometimes people get mystified because they are hearing motivational messages and self-help messages and not really necessarily hearing the word of God. It says in verse 12, it says, The demons begged Jesus, send us some pigs, allow us to go into them. And 13, he gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So these demon spirits, they want to live out their personality inside of us, inside of you and I. As born again believers, they're subject to us. But this is the problem, is that we are possessed by the Holy Spirit. That means that we're owned by the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Is everybody with me? Some like, people look at me like, well, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're owned by the Holy Spirit. We can't be possessed but we can be oppressed. See, if, if an enemy walks in through that door and he's not supposed to be here, but we allow him to be here, he's going to be here. This is where some people are in the spiritual realm. And I'm talking about born again believers. That the enemy walks in through the door, sits down next to his wife, slaps the wife in the face, starts abusing the children, so it's doing whatever he wants in the house, and people are not taking authority over the enemy. Telling him, hey man, I don't know which house you're, you're supposed to be in, but this ain't, this ain't the right house for you. You gotta go. I don't know where you're gonna go, but you gotta go. See, that, in the natural, a lot of people would never allow that. How many of you would not allow that in your house? All right, good, that's like some of you. It's the rest of you guys, you would let somebody come into your house and just be like, you start using your stuff, abusing your stuff. I mean, let me ask the question again. How many of you would allow that in natural? Nobody. <laughs> How many of you would tell that guy he's got to go? Thank you. And if you don't, and, and if you can't tell him to go, call 911 or call me because I'll show up with a couple of the guys from the church. We'll get that enemy out. 
It says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And why am I saying this? Because the enemy has no ability to operate if we deal with him. If we put him on notice and we tell him to go. We, we have a spiritual fight family. And too many people are dealing with it in a natural realm. They think like, it's going to be more willpower. It's not going to just necessarily be more willpower. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The schemes of the devil. That word, wile, actually comes from the Greek word, methodia. Which means methods. There is a method that Satan uses to take you out. To derail you. He did for me. Over and over again, I would fall for the same old, same old. Because he knew my number. I watched the fight one time and there was a boxer and he was in the boxing ring. And he kept falling for the same punch over and over again. And guess what the opponent kept doing? The same punch. The same punch. And I'm watching this guy and I'm like, would this guy just pick up his hand and stop falling for that jab? I was watching it and it was almost ridiculous. But you know what? I, the Lord brought a revelation. I was that guy. I needed to stop falling for the same old, same old. And some of you need to stop falling for the same old, same old. There are spiritual forces that are around us that are trying to entice us to go for it again. And there's nothing new under the sun. And he keeps using the same old thing against us. And we got to say, no, I'm not going for that anymore. You better come up with something new. I'm not going to get offended with my brother or my sister. And you're going to cause contention. I'm not going to get passive aggressive with my brother or my sister. I'm not going to get offended. I'm not going to fall to lust. I'm not going to fall to an addiction. I'm not going to go down the road that I went down once before. We got to say to those spirits. We got to speak to them and pray and take authority over them. It says, for we wrestle not. Too many people are fighting a natural battle. We wrestle not against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are people that have come to me and they've said to me, Hey Rob, can you pray for me because I'm dealing with this and this and this and this. And then Go to Matthew chapter 12 verse 43. I know some of, in Matthew chapter 12 verse 43, it says when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, means it had to be there, right? Either it was possessed, you, before you were saved, you could be possessed by the devil. Some of you were. You know, but when you get saved, you're owned by God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now he can come in, but illegally, and we can force him out. He doesn't have to be there. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, it says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, when you evict him, when you, when you throw him out, he walks through dry places seeking rest and he can't find any. Why? Because demon spirits want to find and live out their personality inside of a pig or an avatar. Some warm bodied person. So because they are disembodied spirits, they want to come and they want to live out their spirit, their personality inside of you and I. And then they want to form strongholds in our mind. And our thoughts. Some people think that that's the way that God created them to be. No, that's a spirit that has come and has been living out its personality so long that habits and routines and ways of thinking have been formed. And it starts with a foothold, but then it becomes a stronghold. And they get built up. It says this, it says that the, he will walk through dry places seeking rest and find them. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I come. You kick him out, he's going to try and come again. And when he is come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Now that sounds good, but that's not good. That means that you got the enemy out and the house is empty. Well, that's perfect. Hey, I'll move back in. Here's what a believer, you and I, are meant to do. Because somebody once, when we years ago, they were like, can you pray for me to be delivered? I said, I'm not going to pray for you. Because you're not ready for it. Because if I kick him out and he comes back, he's bringing seven buddies more evil than himself with it. You're not ready to fill the house. 
You got to fill the house. It says in the last verse, in verse 45, Then go with you and take it with them seven other spirits more wicked. Man, some people are immature. Well, I'll pray the spirit out of you. I'll pray that spirit out of you. Sometimes I'm like, man, I'm not praying nothing out of you. Because you know what? You should be happy with what you got right now. Because you got to fill your house up with the word. Holy habits, divine disciplines, and righteous routines. Then when you're ready to do that part and work on the inner man and inside the soul, then we'll pray that thing out. Because he's going to come back with seven spirits more evil than himself. The best way for us to gain and maintain deliverance and healing, no matter what it is that God set you free from, is to make sure, real simple, you are filled with the Spirit. Filled with the presence of God. Filled with the Word. Sometimes people are fighting a spiritual battle. I see it all the time where people, are, you know, I mean, I've been on the front lines dealing with things, helping people to get set free from everything you can imagine for the past two decades and more. And the best way for them to be set free and maintain their deliverance is really simply to stay filled with God's presence. Don't go and start to fill yourself with something else. Some people are filled with pride. Some people are filled with lust. Some people are filled with anger. We want to make room for the Holy Spirit in our lives. The number two, here's the second one, is our soul. The enemy builds up these strongholds in us. So sometimes people are like, well, the devil made me do it. Oh, I love that one. I love that one. Flip Wilson, right? The devil made me do it. How many of you know who Flip Wilson is? Guess what? You're a boomer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. It's better than going fast nowhere. Right? <laughs> well, I'm in the middle there. It's like, I said, I'm Gen X. Gen X. X marks the spot. That's where the treasure is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the illish, the, this, is, this is what one man said to me. Oh, the devil made me do it. Like it was all the devil's fault. Every bad decision he made, oh, the devil made me do it. This person, he had done something over and over again, hurt a bunch of people. The devil made me do it. Like he had no personal responsibility in it. And I was like a naive Christian. I was thinking, well, the devil made him do it. So he has no responsibility. I was thinking, I guess I got to pray for him more. No, the battle has to be fought on two fronts. We prayed for you, but now you need to make sure that you tear down the strongholds in your mind and you deal with what's in your heart. Because this is what the Bible says to me. In James chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God doesn't tempt anybody. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. Every man is tempted. This is the part. This is the part where sometimes people don't, you know, this is where I have underlined in my Bible. Because if anything ever takes me out of my Christ-like character, I have a rule. It's never anybody else's fault. It's never Satan's fault. I got to take personal responsibility of it. That's tough in a world where everybody says it's somebody else's fault. Oh, I got upset because mom did this or dad did that or that person spoke. That's somebody that has like a victim's mentality. Like, they're saying that other people are in control of them. That's really what they're saying. Where I've learned is if you want to, if I'm going to be a victor being trained to reign in the kingdom, that means I got to take personal responsibility. That means that it is never somebody else's fault if I step out of my Christ like character. And it's not somebody else's fault if you step out of your Christ like character. Because sometimes people are like, well, I got upset, I got me angry. Got... It says this, this is the part. When he is drawn away of his own lust, his own lust, her own lust. Something that's inside of us that's reacting. There's a button, a hook, a trigger, an open door. I've been around, I've heard all of the spiritual lingos for it. There's a button, a hook, a trigger, something inside of us. Because you know what, there's certain things that some of you don't react to. How many of you know there's certain things that like, you just can't be tempted with? Because it's not an issue in your life. But then, you know, there's other things you get tempted with. Right? Other things that you can fall to. There's a methodia, there's a scheme, there's a tactic. And we need to be aware of those things. We need to pray about them. But also, now we need to deal with the areas of our soul. Our 
mind, our will, our heart. You know, again, dealing with them is crucifying our flesh. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. That's how we deal with it. We pray about it, but then we also deny ourselves the things that we want. So let me read that verse again to you. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted for God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the end game of it. It's death. That's the end game of every sin, by the way. Here, let me give you pride. Pride is, wants to isolate other people, separate you from other people. It wants to isolate you. Well, I know better than everybody else, so we won't listen to any counsel. Well, that person is very subject to deception then. Anger. Person, and really, anger is just really rooted in rejection. It's like, I got hurt by somebody, so now I'm transposing that onto other people. Well, the enemy can use that now is to cause, a, if we don't deal with that rejection and that hurt, and allow God to meet that unmet need inside of our heart, inside of our soul, we're going to always be susceptible to it. There, there was a man, he shared with me a great testimony. He got set free from X, Y, and Z, whatever you want to put in there. And he said, this is what happened. He said, I had to pray against the enemy, but then I also had to deal with it in my heart. I had to bring my heart before the Lord. I had to be honest about the things that I was tempted with. I had to ask for help. I had to ask for accountability. I had to crucify my flesh. I had to deny myself the things that I wanted. And then somebody asked me a couple times recently, it's like, will that always be a problem? And the answer is no, because you'll starve that thing to death. The Bible tells us to mortify, to crucify the areas of our flesh that we get tempted in. Not to put it to sleep, but put it to death. There's a difference in that. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Ungodly desires that are left inside of our heart that we don't deal with, leave us susceptible and vulnerable. It gives the enemy opportunity to cause us to sin. Could be this. Well, you know what? I just want to be in a relationship. I just want to be in a relationship. I just want somebody to... If that's the need, then the person is susceptible to just being in the wrong relationships. Where there's a, an unmet need inside the person's heart. Where they have to have such a strong relationship with God... That when they do meet the person, that person is not meeting the person's need because God has already met that need. They're not going to be subject to deception. This is what my goal is all the time. I want to be able to say like Jesus said, there is nothing in me. That's a big statement that Jesus makes. There's nothing in me. There is no area, there's no button, hook, or trigger inside of my soul that it can, the enemy can kind of pull on my heartstrings and lead me astray. I want to make sure that none of those things exist in my heart. My goal, your goal, our goal is to have nothing inside of us so that he could pull us away from his will so that we would step out of our Christ-like character. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh means that we walk in a human body. We do not war after the flesh. We're not fighting a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold. Remember, it starts out as a foothold. You play with the thought. You pamper it a little bit. You just, that's how, that's how it starts. A person who ends up in an addiction to pornography or commits adultery, they, they just start off. It starts off with just playing with the thought. And they play with it. No, but then after they pamper it a little bit, play with it a little bit, and then, they, then it starts to give birth. And then at the end of it, it brings forth death, where God wants us to circumvent that whole process and deal with the, the thing as it's in our heart. He says in the scriptures, he says, if a man looketh upon a woman and lusteth in his heart, he has already committed adultery. That's, whoa, that's big time. God. So he's telling us, deal with all the little foxes inside of our heart before so we become immune and invulnerable. As believers, if we'll fight the enemy on two fronts, then we're going to really experience victory because what I've watched people do is get into a bad circumstance and fight, fight, fight. Then they get to a place of victory. But then 
they get slack and lazy and they don't maintain their deliverance. They start opening up little doors and they start allowing little thoughts where we have to keep casting down those vain imaginations. This is what I found out a vain imagination is. A vain imagination is not a sinful. You know what vain imagination is? Just useless. He's, he's saying in the scripture to us, don't waste your mind thinking about useless, stupid stuff. Fill it with stuff that's going to profit you in your walk, which is the word of God. Cast down the imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The obedience and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is what a stronghold is. In Israel, there was a stronghold during this road. I know some of you have heard the, um, the road to Emmaus. Well, there was a stronghold. What a stronghold was is a huge fortress. The enemy had gotten into this fortress and they couldn't use that road any longer for travel or for merchant trading. So they had to form another one. And for years, the enemy dominated that territory because they had, he had, they had a stronghold there. Until so finally the enemy was defeated, that stronghold was removed. And now the Israeli forces occupied it and they changed the whole territory. This is what I have tried to do in my walk with God because there was a time where I used to feel like the mountain, the world, like I had the mountain on top of me. But I had to change strongholds in my thinking, in my way, and I think you can relate too. We have to change some of the ways that we see things and our perspective. And so as they gained the victory, they began to control the territory. There's a territory that God wants you to control. And it's going to start with us casting out the enemy, evicting them, but then developing our souls so we're not subject to those temptations any longer, crucifying our flesh so that when the enemy comes knocking on the door and he brings the same old, same old, we're not open to it anymore. We can tell him, Mr. Devil, you got to go down the street because that house is not just empty, it's filled with the Word of God, with the presence of God, with the things of God. This is what Francis Frangipan wrote in his uh, book called The Three Battlegrounds. While Paul was facing specific verbal attacks from local opponents, more generally, the meaning of the strongholds that are raised against the knowledge of God, is this is what a stronghold is. Any type of argument or concept that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. There, by giving the devil a secure place of influence in an enemy's thought life. Our minds are where the battle is right now. We cast the enemy out and he's gone. But now we have to fight the, the battle in our mind, in our heart. We have to allow the enemy no place in our mind or in our heart so that he can bring in a foothold and then eventually develop a stronghold. And this is how you do it. Two ways, just like in the natural, this is the way that that stronghold was won. I thought, man, you know what, if they got a stronghold, then we just storm the gates of that stronghold and we take down the enemy. No, they got an advantage They're already there, their position. This is the way that they deal with siege warfare. You know, in a stronghold, if there's a fortress, this is what they do. They surround the fortress. And this is what we have to do as believers. We got to surround ourselves with truth. Surround yourself with truth. You can, uh, this is for me. I can't afford to think thoughts that are not in line with God's word. I can't betray my destiny. You, you have such a great destiny. You can't afford to play around with those thoughts. You, ha you have to surround yourself with the Word of God. Be in the things of God. Some of us, how many of you have been feeling the battle the last couple of weeks? All right, raise your hands. All right, the rest of you, don't worry, you're going to get it soon enough. <laughs> be prepared for the battle. We're in a fight. Somebody said to me, hey, Rob, you know what? The victory's already won and we got the battle. I was like, okay, you know what? He was giving me a bunch of like, you know, scriptures. And I said, yeah, that, that sounds good. You're right. We got to enforce the victory. Then the guy was all prideful and telling me all of this stuff. Then he's broke, busted, and disgusted. He was beat up from the feet up. He was tore up from the floor up. I meet him, I'm like, this guy is like a mess now. Oh yeah, you know better than me, huh? Now tell me about we're not in a fight. 
Tell me we're not in a fight. Oh, we're in a fight. You can deny we're in a fight. Like the guy who keeps getting punched in the face. Oh, we're not fighting. We're not fighting. I mean, you got two black guys already. You're in a fight. We're in a fight. We're in a battle. We're enforcing the victory. We have been dropped behind enemy lines. And it's up to us because Satan's after your family. Satan's after your children. He's after your children's children. He's after your ministry. He's after everything that you got and then some. Now, we don't have to live in fear because we got the victory. But we have to make sure that we're not ignorant to Satan's devices. We've got to make sure that we're, we're fighting. If we're going to cast them out, cast them out. And then we're prepared because he's going to come and he's going to test us on it. So we surround ourselves with truth. These are some of the things that I do to surround myself with truth. When the fight is fierce... You'll see me at the altar. You'll see me worshiping even more. Sometimes people are like, oh, no, you don't go to the altar just when things are good. Sometimes all of heaven is about to break loose. You get know what I'm saying? When you go to the altar, it's not like, oh, everything's great. No, sometimes all of heaven is about to break loose because there's great opportunity. So you go to the altar and you worship. Why? Because we're picking up our spiritual weapons. We're not picking up natural weapons. We spend time in prayer. My prayer life has doubled since we've entered into this uh, time of spiritual warfare. Praying in the Spirit and all those things. There was a morning message. Listen to that morning message. Praying in tongues. Memorizing Scripture. That's how we surround ourselves with truth. Some people, they're not doing it. And then they're getting the results of it. Right? You watch them. They're up and down Christians. The next one is this. We want to cut off the supplies. Cut off the supplies. Here's how we cut off supplies. So once you surround the stronghold, you cut off the supplies. You don't allow that thing to be fed anymore. Real simple. Eddie's got a great story about uh, two wolves. I sh- I'm going to share it with you. He's like, if you feed your spirit, your spirit gets big and strong. You start to look. There was a guy that was like gigantic in our church. He would walk through the church like this, and then when he would get to the doorway, he used to be joking, he'd go like this. And then kind of... But he was feeding his muscles. He was working them out. He was strengthening them. He got big. Well, if we feed our spirit, we're going to get big and strong. And the enemy's going to look at you. And he's going to be like, man, I don't want to mess with that guy. I know he's strong in the Lord. I'm going to go find somebody weaker to mess with. Just like in the natural. So we, we want to cut off the supply. We want to make sure that, that the enemy doesn't have any room to speak into our spirit. That's what Eve messed up with, right? Eve messed up. She was listening to the enemy where she should have just told him, can I use this word? Shut up. Shut up. Some of us need to tell Satan, shut up. Shut up. Jesus' name, shut up. Not listen to what he has to say. Cut it off. Remove yourself. Paul said to Timothy, he said, flee youthful lusts. Flee. Run from those things. There are some things, it's okay to run from them, right? So the two ways that we're going to fight is this. Surround it with truth and then cut off the supplies. Cut off the supplies. Make sure that the enemy can't be reinforced. Eventually the stronghold gets weakened. And most of the time if you study history, siege warfare is, is won by this. They surround the stronghold and they cut off the supplies. And that's how we'll gain the victory. Brothers and sisters, this morning, I I really sense that there is, even more so, a heightened time of battle. And we're all fighting the good fight. What I'd like to ask everybody to do is, is the worship teams come forward. Let's pick up our spiritual weapons. Pick up your spiritual weapon by worshiping the Lord. If you feel led to worship at the altar, let's worship. Surround yourself with truth. Sometimes people are like, oh, is everything going well? That's why Rob is worshiping? Yeah. Is everything going bad? Is that why Rob is worshiping? Yeah. Is everything kind of coasting? Is that why Rob is worshiping? Yeah. There's always a time for me to worship. Always. As I'm maintaining the victory that Jesus has given to me. You're enforcing the victory that Jesus has given to you. So I want to invite you, the other people that don't want to come to the altar, I want to ask you to find two or three brothers to pray for. Pray with and pray for the other people in the body of Christ. So everybody's got to do something this morning. Let's get our spiritual calisthenics.
No pew potatoes at Integrity Church. Praise God. If you feel like you're meant to be at the altar and worship the King, surrounding yourself with truth, praise God. That's the position of victory. If, if everything's okay and you're not going through a time of battle, find somebody to pray with. Pray for, pray for me. I'm going through a lot of them. Praise God. Pray for your brother. Pray for your sister. So a couple people undecided. Hey, I look at it this way. If, if you leave the church because I'm pushing you to do the things of God, sorry, this probably isn't the church for you. I love you guys. I love you enough to make sure that we're fit for battle. Because we are in a fight. You can't look around in the world and say that we're not in a fight. Let's pray. Let's worship. Take those spiritual weapons up. Let's sing to the enemy. Not my house. Not my house. Not my church. Not my family. The enemy's going to have to go through me. He's going to have to go through you. He can't have our destiny. He can't have our children. He can't have our marriages. He can't have our inheritance. He can't have our health. He can't have our future. He can't have it. Worship.
Father, we thank you, Lord, that we're not waiting for the enemy to come to our camp. We're going to his camp. We're going to take back what he sought to steal, Lord. We know that Satan's a defeated foe. We're not going to treat him like he's an equal, because he is in no way a comparison to our Lord, our Savior. We're on the winning side, and Satan is defeated. We thank you, Lord, that the victory is ours, Lord, and that we're enforcing that victory, that we do win. We win, Lord. We've gone to the end of the book, and we know that you're coming back with a sword coming out of your mouth. That you are coming with the cold, the chosen, and the faithful, Lord, and we're determining now to be with you on that day. Father, we thank you that the victory is ours and that we enforce the victory here on the face of the earth. That your kingdom would continue to be advanced through our families, through businesses and ministries, Lord. Every vehicle that you have entrusted to us to steward, Lord, that your kingdom would continue to be advanced. I pray that you would prosper, my brothers and my sisters, Lord. That we're not going to look at what we're going through, but what we're going to, Lord. We know that you're a faithful God, that you have everything well taken care of. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. If you're a to give some five people a high five, tell them you got the victory.